We can now speak to Phyllis Bennis in Washington. She directs the New Internationalism Project at the Institute for Policy Studies, working as a writer, activist and analyst on the Middle East and UN issues. Thank you very much for speaking to us. Uh, we know that the United States has helped to fund UNRWA since uh, it was established in 1949. Mm -hmm. What would be the purpose then of altering that now? Well, I think it's very important to recognize that while on the one hand this is an, an expression of the incredible cruelty of this administration, that they're prepared to simply wipe out the, the basic needs, food, medical care, basic education, of this incredibly large and disempowered uh, refugee community, one of the largest refugee communities in the world, Palestine refugees. But at the end of the day, this is not just about UNRWA. This is not just about cutting the funding. This is about eliminating the understanding that there are Palestinian refugees who have the right to return to their homes under international law and specifically under UN Resolution 194. And what the Trump administration is trying to do here, I think, is say that the, the possibility of return being the, the question of refugees and their right to return being one of the, uh, the final status issues that was understood by everyone to be a critical part of resolving this long-standing conflict is being taken off the table. They took Jerusalem off the table. Now they're taking refugees off the table. I suppose next will be the other two settlements and borders. The U.S. will declare what the solution should be, and that will be that. That will be the end of any sense of negotiations over this conflict. And the issue will come back to what the Israelis have asked for, which the Trump administration seems to be accepting, that the goal is what they would call the end of the conflict. Not the end of occupation, not the end of injustice, not, any, not anything having to do with states, but purely the end of resistance and the sense that if there is any resistance by anyone, any expression of dissatisfaction, that will be seen as an indication of extremism and will be absolutely dealt with as, as an example of extremism. This is a very dangerous indication here because this goes far beyond just cutting the, the budget for UNRWA. And the, uh, the way the Trump administration is, uh, their approach to these issues that are meant to have been negotiated as part of a comprehensive peace pact, uh, how permanent are these decisions? Is any of this something that could be reversed by future administrations? Yes, this could certainly be reversed by future administrations. The question is, you can't reverse the impact on children who will die because they can't get medical care. You can't reverse the impact on students who will no longer be able to go to school. UNRWA has yet to announce, they're supposed to be announcing any day now, whether school will begin at the end of August as it is supposed to because they don't have the money for it. So you can't reverse those things. You can reverse a decision going forward. You can't reverse the past. We were hearing just uh, there earlier from Chris uh, Gunnis from UNRWA, and um, he was saying that uh, he was putting on a brave face, saying that the organization has robust support from the international community, but is that enough to uh, counter this sort of opposition from the United States? It may well be enough to counter the consequences of a, a massive cut in, in the budget the massive slashing of the, the U.S. aid budget uh, for UNRWA. It may be enough to do that. There may be other countries prepared to step up. What it can't do is reverse the political point which is behind this attack on UNRWA, which is the attack on the legitimacy of Palestinian refugee rights. And if you don't have a solution based on justice, based on 194, for those Palestine refugees, you're not going to have a peace agreement. You're not going to have an end to the conflict. You're going to have another version of a U.S.-imposed uh, end to a certain phase, but it is not going to go away. When you ask the king of Jordan, uh, who has 60 percent of his population already are Palestinians, and say, we demand that you make them citizens, uh, meaning that the, the uh, percentage of Palestinians among his population would be far higher than that of uh, Jordanians themselves, I think it's quite unlikely that the Jordanian king is going to agree to that. I think that in Lebanon, where there's been a great deal of concern about how 
normalizing the lives of Palestine refugees who are very much oppressed in Lebanon, we should be clear. They are excluded from numerous occupations, etc. If that were to be reversed, the very delicate balance of the longstanding confessional system that holds Lebanon together would very definitely be at risk. So I don't think the Lebanese government is going to be interested in this either. This is something that is being imposed by the United States at the behest of Israel and its U.S. supporters. And at a moment when Netanyahu is personally facing the possibility of being indicted, his concern is not those, the Druze that we saw protesting, other Israelis who may protest this kind of a move. His concern is on his right. His cabinet is made up of the right, the far right, the extreme right. He is not so worried about those to his left. He's worried about those to his right. And in that context, he's asking for more and more extreme uh, demands. And the Trump administration, Jared Kushner in particular, seems completely willing to give in to those demands. Oh, uh, a number of um, underlying factors at play here. Thank you for touching on some of them for us. Phyllis Ben is there in Washington. Thank you, Phyllis.